So this is an important question that came in, and I wish I could give credit to the questioner, but unfortunately the name that it came in under on our YouTube channel uh, is sort of a uh, YouTube user-generated kind of name. So um, I wish I could give you credit, but thank you, uh, whoever you are. Um, can you explain, here it is, can you explain the two Gospels? A lot of churches are trying to teach that there has to be signs and wonders in addition to the Gospel because Paul said signs and wonders, and the Apostles also worked signs and wonders. Let me start by, uh, uh, again, reiterating this is a very important question because, uh, as we've said a lot lately, and we've said on Sunday mornings quite a bit in our study in Galatians, the Gospel is something, and it is therefore by definition not something else. The Gospel is very simply as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, or as Jesus himself, or this debate as to whether it was Jesus or John saying this, but John 3, 16, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And then Paul explains uh, the gospel in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 3 and 4, where he says, I... Uh, remind you again of the gospel, that Christ died according to the scripture, that he was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to the scripture. So that's the gospel. The gospel has to do with salvation. It has to do with the idea of someone being brought from darkness to light, from death to life, uh, from the broad road that leads to destruction to the narrow road that leads to everlasting life. And it is, it is, it is the idea that by faith we, uh, we, we are imputed or we are justified, we are imputed with the righteousness of Christ, declared righteous, uh, by faith in, in Christ's both who he is and what he did. In other words, in his deity and in his merits, uh, in having gone to the cross to pay for our sins once and for all. If you believe that, if you in fact uh, confess with your mouth that Christ is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now, Notice in that, and in any other presentation of the gospel, that the gospel itself does not bring with it the necessity of signs and wonders or anything like that. That's one thing. The other side of that coin is that we, we ought not believe that there are no such things as signs and wonders, that God doesn't still do miraculous things through his servants from time to time. Uh, so, okay, well, if we believe both of those things, then what's the problem? Well, as the one asking the question brings up, there are churches um, and entire movements and some popular people, um, uh, at least within purported Christendom, uh, that would lead us to believe that these two ideas, divine healing and the gospel, are in fact all packaged together uh, as, as, as the gospel. In other words, um, it is because Christ died for our sins and as it says in, uh, as a matter of fact, in Isaiah 53, uh, and this is where uh, sort of a springboard for this idea comes from, uh, Isaiah 53, uh, verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Uh, all, and verse 6 goes on, all we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In verse 5, it mentions that by his stripes we are healed. Um, uh, and those within this idea that, that hold a framework of the gospel that includes, uh, that necessarily includes physical healing alongside of the spiritual healing that is given to us uh, in terms of our salvation uh, would point to this verse in uh, Isaiah 53 and say that. Uh, not only did Jesus pay for our salvation, but he paid for all of our healings. By his stripes were healed. Now, it doesn't take any kind of a, you know, uh, uh, seminary student to look at the context of the passage and see here that the entire context has to do with our iniquities being taken away, with our sin being put upon him. He's bruised and crushed for us and our iniquities and such. There's not all of a sudden this sort of detour to physical healing, and then it goes back to the idea of our salvation. No, the whole thing has to do with our salvation. Again, that doesn't discount that God does do healing from time to time, but it certainly, the passage does not convey the idea that all of our healings are, uh, are paid for by his stripes in the same way that all of our sin is washed away. Although those who hold that view, the, the alternative view to what I'm saying, would sort of equate those things, and not even sort of, they would equate those things. Uh, and I would... I would um, I would immediately caution you against anyone who teaches such a thing. Now, again, we don't discount the miraculous on the part of God. This is often the, the sort of the false dichotomy that, that those who embrace that theology 
uh, would, uh, would, 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 would presume that those of us who don't must therefore believe. Uh, oh, you don't think God heals. You don't think this, you don't think that. Or you don't, uh, you know, hold that. Well, no, I don't think that God always heals. And I think Scripture is clear that God doesn't always heal. Um, and I think we need to consider that. Um, in that theology... Uh, well, let me let me just add a couple of other things here. In in Jesus' ministry, um, in the gospel era, the the period of time of the four gospels, uh, clearly he did many many miracles. He healed the sick, he raised the dead, he provided food and multiplied food from a meager amount of food and fed thousands with it. Uh, he spoke to the weather and it obeyed him. He commanded demons to come out with any kind of the ritualistic sort of practices that sometimes are associated with such ideas. He just spoke to them. They understood and recognized his authority, and they obeyed. Uh, and and that's because of who he is, and and his obvious uh, uh, authority that that goes with his deity. Um, he also gave the disciples uh, the command to go forth and do many of these same works: uh, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, things like this. Uh, Matthew chapter ten, uh, he gives them authority to go and do some of these very same things. In John chapter 14, verse 12, he talks about how, uh, matter of fact, let's read it. Um, in uh, John 14, uh, verse 12, uh, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also he will do also, and greater works than these uh, he will do, because I go to my Father. Uh, sometimes, as, as a connected aside, people think greater works means that uh, we'll do works that are of greater um, uh, you know, demonstration of power or something like that. We'll do a work that's better in effect. That's not in fact true. What, what, what miracle could be greater than uh, not only raising the dead and not only rising from the dead himself, but even taking all of the sin of the world upon himself and paying for it? Uh, clearly, we're not going to do better works than he did. We could do more in scope by virtue of the fact that we are all still on the earth and he may choose to uh, provide for miraculous activity through us, and by virtue of our number, we can do greater in scope and that kind of thing, but certainly not greater in kind. Um, but Jesus did uh, speak to them about the fact that they would do miraculous things, and even, uh, again, numerically, more than Jesus did. Um, so, um, what's the problem? Well, the problem is when we assume that because of uh, Jesus' stripes, providing for healing, if that's how we're interpreting that, that we therefore are sort of under the conundrum that therefore the healings are paid for. Now, uh, groups like the New Apostolic Reformation uh, embrace this idea wholeheartedly. There's an entire group of people that believe themselves to be apostles and prophets on par with those who uh, were around in the first century, uh, those who were handpicked by Jesus, those who were foundational to the establishment of the church and, and all that kind of a thing, that they somehow now have picked up the mantle from those and are now a modern-day uh, version of that, uh, who are not only empowered in, in that way, but also are emblematic of the fact that, they, that the kingdom age is about to be ushered in. Now, there are all kinds of theological ramifications for that, uh, including the idea that there's no belief in a rapture because, uh, by and large, I, I can't say that I know that's true for everybody who's in that uh, of that belief uh, in, in the NAR and that. But as a general rule, we're not looking for the rapture in that perspective. We're looking to usher in the kingdom. And the signs and wonders are uh, an indication of that coming in the same way that Jesus told his disciples to preach the coming kingdom and, the, and to show miraculous signs as an indicator of that. Um, well, already there's a theological issue. Uh, I, I would say a dismissal of the idea of a literal rapture of the church would be a wrong theology. You won't go to hell for not believing in a rapture, but I do think it affects a lot of things in terms of your eschatology uh, and such. And so we want to consider the implications of some of the beliefs that come with uh, this idea of a gospel that necessitates healing, physical healing. Um, people like Bill Johnson are, you know, uh, are huge in this uh, arena and, and, again, frankly, should be avoided. Um, uh, uh, people like Bill Johnson have, well, Bill Johnson himself has literally said that he does not want to give space in his theology for, uh, for sickness and disease and such. Uh, well, sorry, Bill, but sometimes there is uh, sickness and disease and God does actually 
use that. Now, now Bill, by the way, just as a, another quick aside, I don't want to spend a lot of time on Bill Johnson, um, but um, when asked to explain what he meant by that, uh, he used a lot of very confusing lines of reasoning to sort of say that, you know, yeah, God can use uh, illness and sickness and such, um, but that's not really his design. In other words, his design is not that you would be sick or anything, but if you are, he can certainly use it, much like, as, as he said, you know, he could use, you know, goofy ideas or, you know, our, our short-sightedness on things or whatever. But, um, but it's not his design for you to be sick. Uh, or to have disease or anything like that. Well, uh, I, I don't know how you explain Job then, because clearly it it was God's design that Job endure the tremendous amount of suffering that he went through, and he had a purpose in that. Uh, Job never knew what that purpose was. Uh, he does now, no doubt, as he's in the presence of the Lord. But um, but at the time, he never understood that. But it's God who actually pointed Job out and invited Satan to to take note of his servant, as if to sort of you know, prod Satan to, to do the things that he did. Uh, and so, you know, to say that God doesn't sometimes initiate some of these things, I think is a little bit misguided. Um, and so, uh, if, if we're going to, matter of fact, one, one last thought on that. Um, this doesn't need to be a super long post by any means. But one more, one more thing on this. Um, and and I, I feel like it's important that we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, I, I don't know that I could discuss this subject without pointing out this passage. Um, now, Paul is referring, uh, Paul has just spoken about his experience being caught up to the third heaven. In other words, he saw things and heard sounds and was in the presence of, of, of you know, uh, of the holy ones and God and such up in, 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 uh, in heaven. And he saw and heard things that were unlawful uh, for men to utter. He just... It was a magnificent opportunity to be in the presence of God in the third heaven. And in verse 7, he goes on to speak to something related to that. He says, Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. Okay. Now, the revelations no doubt speak to what he was just describing uh, in verses 1 through 6. But it, it may entirely be that he's also describing the fact that or referring to the fact that God has also given him revelation that ultimately became scripture and those kinds of things. He was somebody who was used dramatically by God and who God directly spoke to. Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and such. This is somebody who was privy to some pretty sensational uh, interaction with God. And lest he be puffed up beyond measure, exalted beyond measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now, he's saying that this messenger was given to him as a means to keep him humble. Well, Satan's not trying to keep him humble. Satan wants him to be arrogant. He wants him to be puffed up. Paul recognizes that the idea of being exalted beyond measure is a bad thing, and therefore a messenger or an angel, literally a demonic a demonic entity of some kind, was buffeting him for the purpose of keeping him humble. So, was it God's design? Of course it was. Of course it was. It plainly was. And Paul's response to this, I think, uh, or actually, uh, uh, yeah, his response to this in verse 8, uh, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And he goes, goes on. I'll read the rest of it in just a sec. But Jesus, this, this buffeting of Satan was to keep him humble. He calls out to Jesus. Paul calls out to Jesus to, to be delivered from this. And Jesus says, no. He says, uh, my grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. In other words, I'm not going to take this away because it's serving a purpose here to demonstrate my power in addition to the fact that you are ultimately being kept humble as a, 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 you know, lest you be exalted above measure from all the things that you've been given. And so Paul's response to that is that he will boast in his infirmities. In other words, I'm not going to brag about all the things that I've been given, all the visions and revelation and stuff, but rather instead, I'm going to boast in the infirmity. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Uh, I see the value in, in, in going through this right now because it gives Christ's power a chance to be made known. 
a a chance to manifest in my life. Verse 10 continues that thought. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In other words, whatever it takes for me to have to endure that Christ may be magnified, let it be so. And so God, you know, and of course, God does use those things to be uh, magnified in Paul's life throughout. So to make a statement like it's not God's design for you to suffer or that there's no, um, I think the guy who was interviewing him on, on sort of their, um, their, their Q&A time, um, uh, if I remember Bill, Bill, had said, uh, Bill Johnson had said, you know, there's no virtue in suffering, though you can show virtue through your suffering and that kind of thing. Well, there is virtue in suffering. There is a need for that from time to time. There is something in the divine purpose and plan for suffering in the lives of believers. It is part of God's design sometimes. And I think that we need to understand that because otherwise, inevitably, we sort of take on the responsibility for our sufferings. If it's not God's design for me to experience this, then then by definition, I'm experiencing it because of some lack on my part. And, and again, just to point to Bill Johnson as a premier example of, of misunderstanding these ideas, he danced around the concept of, 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 of articulating that it was the person's own fault for going through it, but he said everything else around it short of using those exact words. Uh, even in sort of his way of dealing with it in prayer, it's like, I know it's not you, Lord, but, you know, well, okay, well, Satan may be bringing it about, but I'm only going through it because something's missing on my part, right? It's not God's design that I go through this. So I'm getting kicked around by Satan or some demon or something because I'm not doing something or believing enough or something like that. It's a very, very confusing and inconsistent line of reasoning. Uh, and and it's, it's not because it's just too hard to understand. It's just too hard for him to understand. And so I think that we just, I'm not trying to be casting aspersions or whatever, but this is a false teacher who ought to be avoided. And, and, and inevitably, damage is done to people when they go through sufferings and they're left to think that the reason they're going through it is because of them for some reason. Even if you try hard not to say it's their fault, you, you by default are putting that responsibility on their shoulders. No, sometimes, and I, I've just pointed to scriptures to bear this out, God does use this sometimes. He does use it both to refine us, but sometimes he uses it to be glorified through us. Um, I was just having this conversation with uh, with someone this morning, a friend at church this morning, and uh, we were talking about Johnny Erickson Tata in this kind of a context. Johnny Erickson Tata was a 17-year-old young lady when she dove into a, um, a body of water that was shallow and she didn't realize it and she broke her neck. She's been a quadriplegic ever since. And for years, she struggled with it. But eventually, she came to understand uh, that that this is actually the means by which God is being glorified through her life, as she is able to speak to people's sufferings on a level that that suffering deniers, you know, would would never be able to truly speak to consistently. Not only has she recognized it's it's uh, it's uh, it's God's means of of being glorified in and through her, um, but she actually uh, has has said that you know um, if she could have gone a different way, she might still embrace uh, the broken neck because she recognizes how close she has gotten to the Lord and how she's been able to help others grow close to the Lord in their sufferings. That's a lot like Paul. That's very much like what Paul was saying. And no doubt she has dwelt a good season on that passage and on the implications of it. And I would say we all should. This is the healthy place to go. 2 Corinthians uh, uh, 12, 7 to 10. This is where we want to go to understand suffering and, and to understand what our response to it can be uh, as we grow close to the Lord in it and then therefore magnify the Lord through it. So anyway, the question wasn't about suffering per se, but the idea that signs and wonders must accompany the gospel uh, is a belief that is most often associated with those who would hold uh, the views of like the New Apostolic Reformation, which is fundamentally a kingdom now kind of a theology. Uh, the idea that the church is going to somehow bring about the kingdom for Christ to come and return to, that he might rule and reign over it, uh, which in itself is another theological uh, 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 problem. Um, in Daniel chapter 2, uh, Daniel chapter 7, uh, Revelation chapter 20, um, there or 19, I should say, um, there is no indication whatsoever 
that anybody is setting up the kingdom of God except God himself, Christ at his return, uh, the Ancient of Days, Daniel 7, the rock cut without hands as, uh, as, uh, as seen in Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2. The church is not going to usher in the kingdom. The church is not going to uh, bring about the kingdom for Jesus to return or anything. Rather, instead, Jesus is going to return to a world that is wildly rebellious and a, a, at a time when the church won't even be here because we'll have been snatched away by that point. I believe at least seven years prior to that point, uh, if not more. And so even that part of the theology is flawed. And, uh, and I'm speaking pretty directly here because um, there are a lot of things we can be mistaken about, but we need and still be saved. We can have a wrong understanding of a few peripheral kinds of things. Uh, again, rapture timing or if there's a rapture, uh, those kinds of things. But we, we need to recognize that there are implications to those mistakes, uh, in the in the in the um, um, in the field of suffering and, and healing, it is leaving people feeling condemned and crushed in their faith because they believe they don't have enough faith to be healed. Otherwise, they would be because after all, Jesus stripes paid for our healings. Um, uh, in terms of kingdom now theology, the idea of uh, kingdom dominion theology that uh, sometimes variously called Joel's army and that kind of stuff. Um, we, when we think that we're now responsible to bring in the kingdom, well, now you've got all kinds of very, um, uh, very, a very different approach to how we uh, see our role in the world that we're here. Uh, not to take too long on this, but this is another common uh, th- or, uh, um, um, thing that's come up a bit lately. Uh, the idea that the church is supposed to somehow get so involved in politics that we change the world for Jesus. We ought to get involved in politics. We ought to be involved in, uh, uh, in, in, in life and society and culture, and we ought to stand for what's right and good all the time. But there is a difference in our approach when we think that we're going to bring the kingdom about as opposed to Jesus bringing the kingdom about. If we think we're bringing the kingdom about, then we're actively doing this so that Jesus will come back and, and, and you know, once we've set things right, and so we're going to have a very different kind of a focus in our quote-unquote ministry in that. However, if we know that Jesus is going to come back at his own time, then our mission isn't getting the world ready for him to come back, we, we, but rather instead to be on a search and rescue mission, trying to bring those uh, into the light they might see the truth of, uh, of Christ and put their trust in him before he comes back. It's not about changing the world and making culture and government and society more Christian-like. It's about bringing people into the family of God that when Jesus comes to establish his kingdom, they will, they will reign with him. They'll be in the kingdom age with him uh, and not awaiting judgment. It's, it's a very different goal in mind based on that eschatological view. Ideas do, in fact, have implications associated with them. So the idea of this two gospels, there is only one gospel. Every other gospel is a false gospel. However, even though someone may truly believe uh, uh, as they should in regard to their salvation, but be mistaken about this idea of healings all being paid for and therefore everyone should be healed, uh, or the idea of bringing in the kingdom, you can, you can be saved and still have these wrong ideas, but there are implications that grow out of that. And they're very unhealthy, and they can be very damaging um, in terms of just daily living and approach and ministry. Um, and, and more could be said on that, but I just want to make sure we understand that the gospel itself is simply revolves around the idea of our salvation, uh, our righteousness being imputed to us as we are justified by faith in the person and work of Christ. We are declared righteous by virtue of trusting in him and what he accomplished. That's the gospel. When Jesus healed people, uh, it wasn't, uh, well, this isn't necessarily the belief. I was going to say, like, he, he didn't heal believers necessarily all the time. He healed people, and then they came to believe in him. Uh, and so the idea then, therefore, in, in uh, like the New Apostolic Reformation, is that when, when healings are brought, it's, gonna, it's going to lead people to Christ. With that said, though, I am surprised at the, uh, at the remarkable lack of gospel preaching uh, in accompanying signs and wonders. Uh, 
um, which in the New Testament tends to be the pattern. A sign or wonder is done, and then the uh, you know uh, the speaker kind of defers and makes sure that God gets the glory for that he, that miracle, whether it be a healing or whatever. And then the gospel is preached, and people come to faith. They're not coming to faith in miracles. They're coming to faith in the message. The miracle just validated the message. But the message was always the more important thing. That was the end game. In so much of what you see going on in these meetings with these purported apostles and prophets and healers and such, uh, their demonstrations of faith all have to do with the idea of trying to be healed and such. But there's not a whole lot of gospel preaching that accompanies that a lot of times. I can't say always, but a lot of times. I've seen, I've, I've watched a number of hours of these uh, of these meetings and such, and, and it's not about the gospel, it's about signs and wonders. So uh, the whole thing to me is askew. And so that being said, let me bring this to a close. We don't want to discount the reality of God's ability and capacity and even his uh, uh, demonstrating miraculous uh, healing and uh, deliverance you know, from demonic activity and such. I'm not an endorser of deliverance ministry per se, but the idea of people being delivered from demonic activity is a real thing. We see it biblically, and I think it happens today, just like we see miracles in Scripture. And I think we, I, I, I believe there are miracles today. Um, and so we don't throw those things out, but rather instead we just recognize that God is not obligated to always heal because of some misunderstanding of Isaiah 53.5. Clearly, the passage speaks of redemption, the idea of, of, of our iniquities being laid on him, our sin being paid for by him. There's not, there's not really a reference so much to the idea that in the same way that all of our sins are washed away, therefore all of our healings are paid for by his stripes. That doesn't follow, and that's not necessarily true biblically, or it's not true biblically. So I think we just want to make sure that we look at the passages in context, and we let the scriptures say what they say. And we believe them for what they say. And we don't go beyond that. Because when we do, we start to come up with some very odd ideas. The implications of which, again, as I said earlier, can be very damaging. So um, I will admit, I'm kind of uh, biting my tongue a little bit so I don't go super long on some of this stuff. Because I, I have to admit, I, I, I really, on a personal level get very bothered when I hear about this theology of, of, of healings all being paid for, guaranteed, various language used on that, uh, by the stripes of Christ. Um, it's an excruciatingly damaging theology of healing and supernatural power. Um, and it is also remarkably presumptuous upon God, and it's not even really a demonstration of faith, because faith is in God, Right? Uh, the call in Scripture is to have faith in God, right? Well, that means trusting Him, trusting in His wisdom, His ways, uh, His ultimate purposes and plans, and not just sort of the shallow thing that, you know, healing is always what God wants. No, it clearly isn't. We know this from Scripture. It's not always what He wants. Uh, one day, when we have our glorified bodies, there will be no disease or suffering. One day, that will happen, but we're told that in Scripture. But, in, but between now and then, there is no guarantee of healing. We ask, and we ask in faith. We anoint with oil. We believe. We, we do as the scriptures say. We trust, and we pray with faith. But at the end of the day, we, we want to surrender like Jesus did to the, ultimately the plan and purpose of the Father when he said, not my will, but yours be done. Uh, sadly, too many see that, too many in that movement and of that particular uh, uh, belief system see that as a, a, a cry of defeat, it's a battle cry of victory. God, I trust you. No matter what I have to go through, if this is what you have for me, then give me the grace to go through it. Uh, that is, that's not failure. That's faith. That's trusting in the wisdom and the goodness of God, even though I might go through things that might challenge my thinking on that. The truth of the matter is I trust him. And I'm saying that, and I hope if I ever got confronted with something really catastrophic that I would not lose sight of that. But, uh, and I will pray my, my heart out that I might be delivered and, and all that kind of thing. Actually, on that note, I'll, I'll end with this story, and I really will end here. Uh, when we moved to Tennessee from Illinois, uh, uh, and some of you in my church, uh, the church I pastor, not my church, his church, but the church I pastor, have heard me share this before. But when, we, when my uh, family and I moved here to Tennessee, um, everything fell apart. We had lots of reason to see that God was moving us down here. But once we got here, everything just went haywire and sideways. Uh, 
And we went through a really hard season for about three years. And eventually the Lord kind of led us through it and we came to the other side. Now, it was really painful. It was it was very, very painful to go through that season. And I never want to go through it again. Um, but I, I saw the wisdom in it later on when I was talking to another pastor friend who was going through an equally painful season in life. It was at least as equal to, to our pain. No one's sufferings are identical, but I can relate to the idea of going through a very painful season, and that's what he was going through. Uh, and so as we were talking about it, um, I was just... It, this is not the kind of thing at the time I would have naturally thought to say, but I really felt like the Lord had taught me this and I wanted to share with him. And I said, you know, you and I are pastors, which means that we minister to people who are going through hard things. Now, there are those who share, um, uh, who minister like they sort of read it out of a book. In other words, here's two Bible verses, call me in the morning. And then there are others who minister like they've sort of walked a mile in, their, in, in that person's shoes. And that's what we're called to do. It's that kind of um, experience and knowledge of personally having to walk through a difficult time, knowing the Lord's there even when we don't feel like it or understand it. This is what we're called to. So that being said, um, there's value in the suffering, and it is part of God's design from time to time. I'm going to stop there because I think someone's here and the dogs are going crazy. So, Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and grace. And we ask you to give us wisdom and grace as we go through sufferings. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us. Help us to trust you even in the darkest of times, knowing that you're always with us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.